For Science Quickly, this is Rachel Feltman. In our last few Friday Fascination episodes, journalist Sofia Mochino has taken us along for her ride on the Nathaniel B. Palmer, an icebreaker traveling through the Southern Ocean. Today marks the end of our journey with Sofia, so if this is the first time you are hearing about Antarctica in our feed, definitely go back and catch up. In today's episode, Sophia speaks with some of the scientists on the icebreaker as they make their way back home and as they grapple with how to feel about the beauty and horror they've witnessed at sea. After spending two months traveling through West Antarctica's Amundsen Sea on board the Nathaniel B. Palmer, we are approaching the end of our expedition. Researchers collected sea ice in thousands of gallons of seawater at 27 different spots in the ocean surrounding Antarctica. Those samples allowed them to examine different biogeochemical processes, some of them linked to climate change and the future of our planet. We endured bad weather in our quest to reach certain places. One of them was Pine Island Bay a remote coastal area of West Antarctica that is usually blocked by sea ice, even in the summer. We mentioned Twaits Glacier, nicknamed the Doomsday Glacier, in Episode 1. Pine Island Glacier is melting at a similarly rapid rate, discharging lots of glacial ice into the bay. Peter Sedwick, a chemical oceanographer at Old Dominion University and one of the cruiser's leaders, told me sampling of the area in recent years has been very limited. It's not very often open to an oceanographic vessel getting in there. So we're very much hoping to get in there, but at this stage I'm not sure that we'll make it. The Palmer ran through the ice cover sea for hours trying to reach Pine Island. The ship's captain told Peter why breaking through was so difficult. He used the analogy of a, a little kid coming up and trying to hit you as hard as they could and an adult having his hand on the little kid's forehead and the kid's just swinging, swinging at him and not able to get at him. That was the analogy of the ship trying to break through the heavy sea ice barrier. In the end, the Palmer couldn't make it through the heavy ice and the decision was made not to go further. The wind was blowing us toward the shore and if we kept trying, we risked being trapped between the sea ice and the coast. It took us about two weeks to navigate out of Antarctica to our final port in Littleton, New Zealand. During this period, the researchers started packing everything for a smooth demobilization upon arrival. We wouldn't have long at port to unload everything, so the researchers had to start packing samples and equipment on our way to the dock. On our way back, the seas were rough at times and made the ship rock a lot. At night in my room, I could hear the noise of little crumbles of dirt and other debris rolling on the floor as the ship moved from side to side. Sleeping in these conditions felt as if I was tied to a seesaw controlled by energetic children. This continued for about two days, while we navigated through 18-foot swells that left some people, including me, seasick. Annie Stephanides, a research assistant at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, was a first-time cruiser on board. I asked her what she found to be the most difficult part of the trip. Well, right now I'm thinking about seasickness the most. <laughs> that has been pretty challenging, but in the grand scheme of things, it's only been a few days um, where we've actually been transiting, and it's been rough compared to being on stations for like 40 days in a row. On our way back to port, those who did not feel sick could relax and dream about what they would do on land. But time passed extremely slowly, even if we tried to fill it with movies, game nights and arts and crafts. Margot de Buzer, a postdoctoral researcher at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, got bored during this period. But the prospect of leaving the ship was bittersweet for her nevertheless. Time is passing slowly, but then you look back and you're like, wow, that was so fast. And then it's like the end comes before you kind of are actually ready for it. And I always get really sad on like the port call out and everyone saying goodbye. But I feel like you don't really have the time to say goodbye to everyone. So there's a lot of people you just don't say goodbye to. 
the time we've spent all together right now, it's more than like your closest friends in real life because you never spend 24 seven with your really close friends unless you live with them or something, you know? Yeah. So I feel like you, go, you get to know people quite deeply, but at the same time, it's like just once and then you never see them again. So it's pretty, it's pretty weird. As we got closer to land, the prospect of regaining access to the internet and reconnecting with the outside world became almost frightening for some researchers. When our phones are going to start buzzing again and it's like all your notifications from the last three months are like catching back up to you, I find that very overwhelming because we kind of get used to a slower pace of life. Getting back to like real life, it feels like you get back into a city and everything's like really high speed and like everyone's going really fast and there's a lot of things to do. And it takes me a while to like get back into that. During this strange hiatus, it was like we were between two worlds. Not quite in Antarctica anymore, but not yet close to home either. It got me thinking about the one-of-a-kind place we had visited and how the experience had affected us. We had witnessed these pristine icy landscapes. We met countless animals and saw imposing glaciers that didn't look like they could disappear at all. Everything seemed so untouched. I knew about the urgent danger to Antarctica and climate scientists' warnings about the continent's fate. But it was hard to connect that reality to a place that seemed so immaculate. And I wasn't alone in that feeling. I think it's also hard too when you're seeing something so beautiful for the first time because you're like, wow, this is so amazing. Like, I don't see anything wrong with this picture. That's Annie again. But we know that environments are changing, so that's not true. Um, and habitats for these animals are changing and the water is changing. It wasn't at the forefront of my mind, I guess. For Carl Lamborg, a chemical oceanographer at the University of California, Santa Cruz, it was a matter of comparison with other icy landscapes he has seen. If all the dire predictions happen, there will still be ice in Antarctica to some extent, probably. Like when you go to glaciers in Alaska or where I was just in Greenland recently as well, but definitely mountain glaciers, you know, the ones that you can see retreating sort of year after year after year, that really feels like a landscape that is disappearing. The thing that I'm sort of impressed with, and gosh, we only saw a tiny bit here, is how immense this landscape is. And it's hard to imagine that we could melt all of it. But even in this vast and beautiful landscape, the specter of climate change and the potential fate of this area loomed. Marisa Daspins is a doctoral student at the University of California, Santa Cruz. When you're in Arctic, Antarctic landscapes, it's normal to think about climate change and like what's happening. And like the reason why we're here is to look at the influence of the melting ice sheet and what effect that's going to have on the Amundsen Sea. I don't think I always think about it um, because it, it is depressing and sad. But yeah, I think it's something that's like definitely always in the back of my mind. It's such a magnificent place that I would love to come back to. But at the same time, in the back of your head is that like, but will it be like this when I finally get the opportunity to come back? That's Nicole Coffey, a doctoral student at the University of Minnesota. And it, it worries me that it's not going to be this pristine forever. And I don't know that there's com any coming back from it at this point, which is a depressing thought, and I hope there is. Laura Whitmore, the chemical oceanographer at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, says that she finds herself separating the emotional aspects of climate change from her everyday work. I think that a very rational way to look at it is that things change. Um, we're always in a constant state of change, and what I'm trying to do is learn how and why things are changing. And, and that's a very like kind of impersonal way to, <laughs> to isolate that from becoming an emotional kind of part of my day-to-day -day grind. Well, maybe sort of sick, but um, I mean, it's sort of exciting in the sense that any kind of an environment that's changing dramatically feels like an exciting opportunity to, to study things just from a purely scientific point of view. That's one sort of response. The other is, I guess, a kind of a feeling like, oh, we need to document this before it's gone. Balancing the day-to-day -day routine of science with the urgent questions underpinning the research can be challenging. I think we all have our existential crisis every so often. That's Margot again. 
sometimes it doesn't feel like you're making a difference because it's such a slow process to like you know build this work together and like publish it to go from collecting the data to analyzing it to publishing it takes so long that I think sometimes in the process you kind of lose sight of what you're doing and how it's useful. I mean a lot of times we're just very busy with doing the work and it's easy and interesting to get lost in the details but I would say more and more I find myself just uh, reflecting on what we're doing here to essentially understand this process better. That's Rob Shirell, an oceanographer at Rutgers University. He is also a cruise leader and has been on expeditions to the Antarctic several times. Despite his experience in the field, what he sees when he visits is still stings. It's a very powerful and upsetting, and it's really scary. It's sad and scary. And Rob isn't just worried about West Antarctica. There's some good evidence recently that there are places in East Antarctica which are also beginning to melt at unusually fast rates. As we were making our way back from our expedition, scientists published a paper focused on a part of East Antarctica once thought to be relatively stable in terms of ice melt. They concluded that this region could be more vulnerable than previously assumed. And that matters. The authors cite research suggesting that if all the ice in the region's Wilk subglacial basin were to melt, the global sea level could rise upwards of 10 feet. Faced with this kind of emergency, Rob sometimes ponders his role as a scientist. You know, I wonder sometimes if I'm employing my energies in the right direction. It's one thing to study the effects of climate change, and it's important. But it's probably more important to do whatever we can to leave the fossil fuels in the ground. Phoebe Lamb, a chemical oceanographer at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and another lead scientist on the expedition, has similar thoughts. More science is going to allow us to understand the natural system better so that later on we can do something about it. But it's not the most direct solution. If you want to save the world, become a politician, an economist, a lawyer, not a scientist probably, I think, right now. But I also feel like we all have something to contribute. There's like tiny little cogs, right? And there's, you know, whatever, eight billion people in the world. Not everyone could be a lawyer, a policy person fighting for climate policy change. We all need to be contributing what we're good at because the world needs all of our talents in order to like stitch these solutions together. For Phoebe, optimism comes from the power of education. As a university professor, she aims to inform the next generation of decision makers. The science education is hugely important. We need to explain to people why this is important, what's happening, that it's real, that it's accelerating, there's no doubt. Like all of that is, I think, our primary job and that's why I feel like being a professor is important because I can communicate that to undergrads. I'm gonna continue doing science, which is useful, but um, you know, not going to deal with reducing fossil fuel emissions, you know, realistically. Um, and then I'm gonna take my knowledge and my approach to try to sort of help steer the next generation to actually fix it. Nicole also feels that communication is critical. I hope that people seeing things like this, both in like photo form or like through your writing and your podcasts, and if they have the chance to see something similar, like it, I hope it makes them care. I feel very lucky that I could join the researchers on board the Palmer and visit a place as amazing as Antarctica. I hope that the landscapes I witnessed remain intact out there, not just in my memory. I understand that it can be difficult to care about Antarctica if you haven't seen it. Why should anyone care about this remote, icy land where no humans live permanently? But as we have seen in this series, the future of Antarctica is tied to the future of our oceans and our planet. The continent's melting ice will continue contributing to sea level rise, which impacts coastal communities all around the world. And that melting could also change marine biogeochemical processes 
in a way that has a direct impact on our planet's climate. The researchers I met on the Palmer are doing their part, gathering unique data that might help us understand where things are going. But another question remains. What will we do about it? Thanks for joining us on this Friday Fascination Adventure. Next week, we'll be diving into some less pristine waters to learn about Parisian efforts to clean up the Seine in time for the Olympics. And you can look forward to future fascination series about niche archaeological research, video games, and more. But we've got plenty of little science snacks to tide you over until then. Don't forget to tune in on Monday for our weekly Science News Roundup. Science Quickly is produced by me, Rachel Faltman, along with Fonda Mwangi, Kelso Harper, Madison Goldberg, and Jeff Delvisio. This episode was reported and hosted by Sofia Mochino. Ella Fetter, Alexa Lim, Madison Goldberg, and Anaisa Ruiz Tejada edit our show, with fact-checking from Shayna Poses and Aaron Shattuck. Our theme music was composed by Dominic Smith. Subscribe to Scientific American for more up-to-date and in-depth science news. For Science Quickly, I'm Rachel Feldman. Have a great weekend.